Welcome back, everyone, to the Nowscast. I'm your host, Nows, and I have today here with me my lovely friend, Apple Apples. She made her name by herself with her debut story, Disorder of the Phoenix, years ago, and I've been a fan ever since, until I begged enough to work with her. She's the most prolific author I've ever worked with, and has the craziest plot bunnies that she graciously... That she graciously... Jesus Christ. That she graciously <laughs> shares with me. She is a master at time travel and dimension travel fix, and the past couple of years she's branched into the Star Wars fandom, and I adopt her head canon as true canon. It is an absolute pl- a pleasure having you here with me, Apples. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm well, thanks for having me. Um so let's get started. Do how old were you uh and how long ago did you start reading fan fiction? And so how did I you prob- find it? So I probably started around eighteen, nineteen reading it. Um mm-hmm. I was in college. I you know, adjusting to a new city. Um yeah. you moved and, away, right? Yeah. Um I actually entered therapy. So when you start picking at your issues, they tend to be worse in the beginning. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I was like full of anxiety and I was in in insomnia. Oh so that's I fun. would read uh fan fiction because <laughs> it's not as stressful as like real reading like sometimes when i get into a good book mm-hmm. i have to read to the end yeah um with fan fiction it was you could keep reading and, and you could forget it. about it the next yeah. day and it wouldn't be a big problem yeah um sometimes really good novels make you feel a little too much mm-hmm. um for sure so yeah i think i read for two years um what fan and of- then uh, mainly Harry Potter, just because the fandom is so big. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also read uh, Kim Harrison's, um, what is it, the Hollow series. There was Hollow. a few. Uh, there was a few things on that. Uh-huh. Uh, I think Hades and Persephone's like Greek myth stories. Oh. Yeah. Um, Harry Potter is actually not one of my favorite fandoms <laughs> at all. That's surprising, considering how much we know <laughs> about it. It's, well, for me, it's more like a puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of set things in Harry Potter, and there's a lot of interest in Harry Potter, which is why I started writing in it, because I wanted uh, peer reviews. Uh Um, But yeah, that the main reason I read it was just because there was enough good things, there was enough talented writers to really find them, whereas in the smaller fandoms, it tends to be really frustrating (laughs) finding anything that's decent to read Mm -hmm. so so yeah um and then i started writing when i went to india actually and how long were were you there so i was there for five six months that's a lot Uh, how did you enjoy that i loved it i love india it's so beautiful the food was fantastic i'm a vegetarian so it was like the first time in my life I could try different type, like the same food that uh-huh. tasted completely different. Was it too spicy? Because um, I'm not a fan of spicy. <laughs> oh no, I love spice. I couldn't find anything in India that I couldn't stand. Oh. Like, I loved everything. Ah, it's amazing that you had so much of fun. <laughs> um, but I was learning Hindi, and because of my dyslexia, that mm-hmm. kind of stressed me out a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. more than anything else there, it was, like, learning another language that really, like, stressed me out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I got frustrated with what I was finding, because after that point, it was two years of reading Harry Potter. Uh-huh. And I had found everything time travel-wise decent that I could think of. And I was like, okay, uh, let me try writing it myself. Um, it was terrible. I deleted many, many things. <laughs> it was then, you didn't publish though the, those ones, right? I did publish them, but they were only <laughs> out for like a week or two. Oh, I mean, they were not up for it. a long time. Yeah, because I I so. remember reading Disorder of the Phoenix the first time, and like I went into Reddit at the time and started uh, posting about it. Like, guys, watch, uh, read this story. It's amazing. And 
you consider so trashy? Oh, I do. I, I think know. it's absolutely horrid. It's not. It's really fun. And like, it's horrid by my standards. Of, sure. So, but you are also first... your worst critic. So, I am. Uh, but it's also not like the first thing I've ever written. Like mm-hmm. I've actually read, uh, or written uh-huh. to. I think I'd gotten to two or three manuscripts of my own novels, mm-hmm. um, which is really frustrating now because I can't finish anything and I have like this full world, worlds and characters and all these different plot lines, but I'm having a hard time sitting down and writing them. Okay. Um, yeah, because I'm addicted to fanfic writing, which <laughs> I feel like there's worse addictions to have. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And fanfic is fun. Plus, you meet a, a bunch of nice people. And some horrible yeah. ones, too, but mostly nice. No, At least mostly in my nice. Experience. I love the, yeah, I love the connection of fanfic mm-hmm. writing. It's much closer than with original authors. Despite oh, yeah, Twitter's... Uh, I was on Figment. Best. I was on Figment, uh, which was, like, this <laughs> writing site for original writers. Uh-huh. Um, and you had to like trade reviews to get anyone to read your stuff. Ah, kind of so like that was like really some, frustrating. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, some some people trade beta, uh, like you read mine, I read yours, and we change uh, beta yep. reviews basically. Which was really frustrating if someone mm-hmm. had like you gave them a full review and they gave you like two lines. It's like I despise you. <laughs> <laughs> um. When you started writing uh, your first fanfic, did you feel overwhelmed and did anyone help you in any way or it was just by yourself? I think I had a few early betas. Um, but the problem with betas is I would have a lot of people who would try to change the content, um, which for me is really problematic because... Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm like an organic writer, like the characters kind of like speak mm-hmm. and I, I kind of file it away. Like any little things they do, any like little moments that they say, uh, is important for me for continuity later on. Um, I, you know, I flex on that. Like I have a lot of stories, so obviously sometimes yeah. I forget, it's... uh, certain <laughs> things. It's a bit but much. But definitely, like, within the chapter uh-huh. or within writing, if someone adds, like, a phrase or a detail or, like, a visual thing, mm-hmm. sometimes that breaks the flow. Sometimes that directly goes into contradiction of something I had planned later on. Uh-huh. Um, I get a lot of feedback. Or not a lot, but I have people who notice in my fanfic writing that I'm not good at developing scene. Like, visual aspects uh-huh, uh-huh. sometimes. Painting the, um, the scene itself. Yeah. Yeah, which is not the reason I write fan fiction, because I'm an art history major. <laughs> um, I can describe anything so uh, literally a blind person could see it. Uh, and I mean that, like, one of my best friends is blind, and he's just like, for my original writing, half of it is literally just visual. So when I'm working on fanfic writing, like, that's not something I bother with because it eats up a lot of time and because these worlds are typically something they've seen or something they already have an image of. Yeah, so in theory, they should fill in the blanks, basically. Yeah, they can fill in the blanks. I also, as a reader of fanfiction, I sometimes get frustrated with people who really devote too much time to developing the background. It's like, I know what the castle looks like. I know what these characters look like. And unless you're telling me in a way that's furthering the character's actual development, I don't need to spend all this time reading about the background. Mm -hmm. So I know that my writing would be better if I did bring that part to it, but it's something that I do professionally. So I don't feel the absolute need to put it into my fan fiction. It turns a bit more real than fanfic like it becomes more becomes more like uh your own original i suppose yeah and it becomes a lot of work i mean Mm -hmm. i think you can still see that i'm good at it when i have dreams where i get really trippy and yet people are still able to read along Mm -hmm. um that's 
because I have that skill that's been critique and graded, right? See, that, so. yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you started writing, did you focus on anything to improve at first? And is there anything you wish you knew at the time when you started considering your dyslexia and how everything turned out? Well, I think if you look at Disorder of the Phoenix, I was overly responding to some reviewers, oh. and some of the early reviews were pretty crap. And like looking back, it's like a really ruin some of my plot lines. Um, but I have started the very slow process of editing what we lost, which is a good base story, but I find the writing like uh, pretty dry. So I started editing it, and I think I changed almost every single sentence of the first few chapters. And it wasn't even that it was grammatically wrong, mm -hmm. or there was anything narratively going on, but it was just very <laughs> basic. Mm -hmm. uh, the characters were static, um, and there just weren't enough fun details to make the conversations, like, uh, just that actual Feel meat. genuine. Yeah. Mm, I see. Uh, you've mentioned in every chapter you write has a disclaimer that says you have severe dyslexia. Uh, could you tell us a bit how that feels for you and how do you deal with, with being dyslexic uh, considering you're as prolific as you are with your writing? So, I didn't... I was illiterate until seventh grade which is middle school that's i think i was like 12, 12? or 13 yeah. okay when i actually start reading real books yeah that's impressive yeah um it's funny actually when i was little i tricked my parents into thinking i could read oh. uh they would read like books repeatedly to me mm -hmm. and i remember being able to read the pictures Because I remembered what they said, and I associated it so strongly with, like, pictures of butterflies or, like, what a character was doing, that I could repeat what the story was saying uh -huh. based off of just memory. Oh. Which my memory was terrible, so, like, that was impressive. <laughs> it felt like I was reading the pictures. I did not at all read the words. Mm -hmm. I'm actually... I'm pretty bad at this, so where my brain will avoid reading things. Like, I won't read certain signs. If I put notes above my wall, I'll stop looking at it. Oh. Like, I'll see uh, like when it, I'm it just learning blocks. a language. Yeah, when I'm learning a language, I actually remember better the shape of the word than the spelling of the word. Oh. Wow. Yeah. So there's, like, a lot of, like, little tricks that I have to get around <clears throat> with that. Mm -hmm. Um. And, I mean, just learning other languages, like I'm trying to learn French and Hindi, mm -hmm. it just, I have the same exact problems and anxieties I had in first grade. Oh, that sucks. Like, exactly the same. Like, I have better memorization <laughs> tools now, mm -hmm. but really the same exact problems. It's not easier. I'm on the super extreme side of dyslexia where um, it... It affected my balance when I was a kid. Like, there's something that, like, throws off your balance with dyslexia. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. How did you overcome uh, to, like, proper, properly read eventually? Um, Twilight, actually. And the Twilight it's Stephanie series, Myers. Yeah. Wow. Um, and the reason that was because she the way she uses adjectives <laughs> like first of all her writing style is pretty basic mm -hmm. like, yeah, there's a lot of simple is. sentences lots um, of adverbs a lot of adverbs and it's a lot of rep repetitivity uh -huh. like it just continues it continues it continues and i didn't read the book i had an audiobook i remember there's an expression she loves using it's um bella's voice raise uh on higher octave something like that it, it's always that she always uses that to yeah, the point that it gets was... annoying <clears throat> and the, the her way of using uh vocabulary mm -hmm. right she literally looks up a thesaurus and enters the word 
into the sentence, but it's a sentence that frames the adjective, right? If you took the adverb or adjective she's using mm-hmm. and you take it out, the sentence still functions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in reading that, right, she's telling me exactly what the adjective or adverb should mean. Mm-hmm. So it's giving me what that word, like the definition of that word. So it really helped my vocabulary because you have very basic uh, structure oh. to the sentences. You have an explanation for all of the like eccentric words. Because, That's really interesting. Yeah, because reading before that, um, I would have to skip entire words. Sometimes it actually gives me an advantage in learning new languages because mm-hmm. I have to preemptively <laughs> figure out what you're trying to say before you say it. Uh huh. So I can understand anything I like. If I miss a word, I still need to be able to understand what you're saying. I see. Uh, um, because dyslexia is auditory, it's visual, um, it's basically the part of my brain. Like humans have a full part of their brain that is language based that uh-huh. helps you understand language. Mm-hmm. That's why, like, oftentimes we'll be like, listen to the language repeatedly, and you'll pick things up. Yeah, of course. My brain is wired, so it literally misses that step. Ah, uh, I see. So I have, like, no working memory. I think I scored a 4 out of 120 on my <laughs> IQ test. Jeez. So it's, like, nothing. <laughs> um, so the Stephanie Meyer books, I was able to listen to the audiobook. Uh-huh. And I enjoyed them enough that I could read the giant, like, her, like, the printout of those books are giant. Uh-huh. So, like. I was able to listen to the auditory and then read it. And it kind of took away this fear of big books. Ah, that's um, nice. And then I immediately went into the vampire world and then I found adult fiction. Mm-hmm. I went from like teenage crap to like adult horror. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> that's a big uh-huh. leap. And then, uh, like, I found other audiobooks like the Artemis Fowl series. Mm-hmm, I literally mm-hmm. named my dog Artemis Fowl. <laughs> the Harry Potter series, which I love Stephen Fry's voice. Love him. Um, and yeah, I it was all over the place from there. I think I read. So I was illiterate until seventh grade. But in seventh grade, I think I was able to list over 100 books that I had read. Wow. That's because amazing. it's like. If you, like, because I've always been, like, a creative, like, love stories, love imagination, Mm -hmm. but I was deprived of that for so long. Like, I could only watch movies. Like, we didn't have cable. So it was just, like, very limited, the things I could do. So once I could finally read, I was like, this is the best thing ever. When I also had just come out of homeschool. Mm -hmm. Like, I got pulled two years because I was being bullied by my special ed teachers. Ah, that's lovely. Oh, it's perfect. It's like, why are you so slow? You're not trying. Or, I have dyslexia, which as a special ed teacher, you should realize. (laughs) Um, So I was just like, school is amazing. (laughs) When I got back, because I was very (laughs) bored at home. So I totally nerded out. Didn't make me a lot of friends. But (laughs) I I was happy. Um, When did you just... Did you start drawing at the same time, or did you have you uh, so always I have drawn? drawn way way before anything? Mm-hmm. I think I've always drawn. Um, I didn't make anything decent until high school, but I've always drawn. Um, it's what it made was, you want to go into art major. Yeah, I mean, so actually, within first grade, um, we had. I had this teacher who was awful. Mm-hmm. Like she would call me out for not being able to read a section. She uh. she literally said word for word, "Look, uh, Rose can't read a sentence." Wonderful. Like in a round table, and my parents so. noticed that something was wrong because this is before we knew we had I had dyslexia. Uh huh. And there would be all of these papers I just left at my desk because I didn't deal with it. I would go home sick all the time because I would have anxiety attacks uh, and I thought that I had like the flu or something because sucks. I would heat up, right? I would mm-hmm. start sweating. Hands would get super clammy. I went like sheet white. Yeah. Um, 
and my parents like opened up my drawer and found all of these papers that were unfinished and they were like a picture block with lines for text uh-huh. and it was completely empty oh, and my yeah. mom was like why aren't there any pictures because like she draws why are there no pictures and it was because i wasn't allowed to draw until i'd finished writing the sentence uh- so <laughs> i just sat there <laughs> And did nothing because I couldn't do anything. Oh, um, that, that's wonderful. Oh that's yeah, it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, I was not the only <laughs> student she bullied either. I don't know why she was a first grade teacher. She didn't like kids. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, another teacher, my first special edu- education teacher, was fantastic, and she made me like re- uh, words. So it was still hard for me to read at that early stage, but uh, she, we did this like marbling mm-hmm. paper thing where you dip uh, paper into like swirls of paint. Oh. It was, it was so much fun. And we got to write a poem along with that. And my first writing was poetry because it, you could break out of, um, sentence structure Uh uh-huh you could just write like i could use creative words that were very tied to visual things Mm -hmm. um i liked a thesaurus better than i liked a dictionary Uh, (laughs) um and it was not having to worry about punctuation yeah because not having to worry about sentence structure so like my first writing was poetry and it was along with art so Mm -hmm. art has often been the main way I've been able to communicate. I see. Um, and just like being able to express. Because I also had uh, speech impediments when I was younger. Oh. Um, and ma- what ended up getting made them worse uh-huh. was people would correct my speech constantly. Uh, if I said a word wrong, if I had the wrong grammar, they would interrupt me constantly yeah, that breaks to the tell flow. me. Yeah, so I would just speak in a rush. Mm-hmm. And then I wouldn't speak at all if someone wasn't going to... If someone interrupted me, I would stop talking to you. Because oh. it's very frustrating and very like embarrassing to be constantly corrected. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't see anyone else ever have that experience, right? Yeah. Um, so you feel so, singled out. Singled so yeah, out. I had a lot of like emotional issues that I couldn't express mm-hmm. right um you see that a lot in like autism uh where and like some people thought i was autistic and it's that communication issue mm-hmm. right if you cannot communicate what you're saying it builds this frustration humiliation and like self-loathing because most and it times really does build up because most times you do know what you want to say you just can say it right yeah um, and understanding other people, right? It can mm-hmm. sometimes be an issue. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I had fun anger issues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a bit different. Uh, still on the same subject, subject. But do you have trouble reading when there's typos in the text? Do they influence um, that at all? Because whenever I'm writing to you, I always try to make sure I have zero typos. So, I... In oh, my mind, I that. <laughs> yeah. In, in <laughs> so my many mind, typos, I... especially when I'm tired, I like said something to my boss, and I was like, "Oh, that was the wrong word." No, no. Like I, I, I think in my head that having less typos for you to read makes it easier for you. And no, I do Like I can, ask. I can read broken English. Yeah. Like sure. it's one thing where I like one of my best friends is from Sweden. Mm-hmm. And when we first start talking, um, his English wasn't as good or he wasn't as comfortable speaking in English. Mm-hmm. And I just don't notice, right? I had to learn such bastardized English because there's so many words I didn't understand that people were using Before that I still you, needed to matter. follow your conversation. Mm-hmm. So if there is like two or three words missing from a sentence, but, like, the rest of your speech, I can figure it out. Yeah. Like, Makes accents sense. don't bother me at all, because if I heard a few things, 
I can pretty much pick up on what you were trying to say. Yeah. So like okay. broken English for me is very easy. I've never had problems. Does your dile- dyslexia impact your writing at all? Absolutely. Now nowadays, I mean, <laughs> like after so much practice. Um. Yeah. I mean, I still drop out words. Uh. Mm-hmm. Probably the worst for me is reverse negatives. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, I love those. <laughs> Reverse negatives are the absolute best because I say the exact opposite of what, uh, what I meant. You, yep. <laughs> it is the whole like, story. Ah, shit. <laughs> um, yeah, and like, there's always some words that are just like, and it's funny too. I've noticed recently that I've spelled things so wrong mm-hmm. that spell chick doesn't even consider it a spelled it's, word wrong. Word, yeah. It's just like this is just a it's, uh, letters original that's not word. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes that helps uh, happens um, has any of your professional or academic experience helped you in any way as far as the writing um, absolutely right um, yeah we're talking history, about the art mm-hmm. uh, so my background right I'm an art history major mm-hmm. with a painting a double concentration in painting fine arts painting what's a double um, concentration Yep. Uh, and then I have two minors. I have a history minor or a religious studies minor. Okay. Um, so I do a lot of classes. <laughs> uh, and then I also have an MA in the humanities, uh, mostly art history. What's MA? Uh, a master's in, fi- uh, oh. in art history. Yeah. Oh, so I should be calling you a master's. Mistress. <laughs> mistress? No, no, no. You don't have to change my name until I can okay. get a doctorate. Okay. Okay. Because <laughs> like we do here. Oh, you do? That's yeah. awesome. Especially when signing letters and stuff. Aw. Yep. A master means something other than I like put myself into massive amounts of debt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were. Yeah. I mean, I'm very happy that I got my master's. Yeah, uh, I, I went to the University of Chicago. It's a big... And it definitely got me my first full-time job in my field. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely love it. Like, I'm a education specialist mm-hmm. at my local museum. And it is so much fun. I love teaching. Yeah. I'm teaching, like, from I remember like, your first daycare day. to high school. Your excitement so. teaching the kids. It was fun. It was lovely. Uh, They're hearing. so cute. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the pandemic has canceled most people, but we uh, still have like some camps running. So, um, yeah, so I love my job. Um, very happy. Mm-hmm. Despite being in massive amounts of debt, I'm an indentured servant. But, you know, <laughs> I feel like enjoying my life is more important than that. <laughs> For sure. Um, and then, I oh, was the original question. Oh, so, uh, yeah, it definitely is impacting my <clears throat> writing, right? Uh, mm-hmm. you, So I actually noticed this with, I've taken a few English classes, like the fine lit stuff, and I I love my English major friends, but Mm -hmm. most of those classes are absolute bullshit. It's just like bullshit, like just talk about how you feel, or opine on (laughs) whatever, just like the stream of consciousness. Um, Art history is more strategic than that Uh if the sentence doesn't contribute to your point Uh if it does not have a purpose cut it okay yeah that's basically Um, original writing yeah but it's but even like sentences that sound pretty right like art history like people are just like oh it's the it's the study of things that just it sounds pretty or this sounds cool Uh it's not at all (laughs) like you have to have a purpose you have to have a thesis point you have to be making an observation that changes the view of the reader Uh uh it's not like there's no fuzzy stuff right like it has to be precise and precise is just like meaningful Mm -hmm. it has to be very meaningful and at the same time art history like you have to reach a word count Ah, okay. So it's very stripped down, but you have to have a lot to say. Yeah, it's got to be um, tough. Right. So my <coughs> graduate program was a one year. So your your last and your fir- or 
Yep, your last and your first uh, year of grad school, mm-hmm. and you have to write your thesis in that year. Oh, geez. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was like the first time I moved to time. Chicago. It was crazy. Um, I definitely broke my sanity. I've been... Uh, <laughs> It was like one of those things where uh, when I was in India, I had a teacher ask Uh the class, she's just like, and this was relating to Buddhism and Hinduism, she was just like, if you die today, are you doing the thing you would want to be doing? Like, would you be content in this moment or Uh would you rather be somewhere else? Um, And at the time, I was like, no, I'm exactly where I want to be. Uh, I'm very happy with my life. At U Chicago, I was like, if I die right now, I would have wasted the last year of my life because this is insane. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. But at least you got your end, job with the kids. And my thesis was, I had the most fun writing my thesis out of anything <laughs> at mm-hmm. U Chicago. I enjoyed the research. What was the I thing? enjoyed, like, reorganizing um uh, my thesis was about gustave moreau and he was if anyone knows who matisse is uh he, it was his teacher so like the pre-impressionism oh okay. and my thesis was about his eastern <laughs> influences on his art um and the influences on his art cross media So it, like, did my favorite things. It was, like, watercolor, fine arts, um, and then, like, South Asian and Chinese art. Um, I did it. So there was a limited amount of research about Uh watercolors because they don't treat them as seriously. Uh And which is, you know, the hierarchy in art history, the West is the best. Uh And uh, oil paintings are the, like, the end all be all uh-huh. um so my point often was like in so much of my research especially about like this artist or other artists is like this reminds me of chinese painting or chinese ink painting and i'm like oh that's cool um yeah except you're referring to like over 500 years of history oh <laughs> <laughs> so Thousands of painters, thousands of different art styles, thousands of different regions. The same with, uh, I, he had a lot to do with like Mughal miniature paintings Mm. and like, uh, Hindu miniature paintings, which is this specific, uh, it's like opaque watercolors with, uh, oil prints, uh, Uh kind of like illuminated manuscripts in the West, but the art style is prettier, in my (laughs) opinion. Um, so it's just like this rich history um and you just scratch the surface whereas i i swear to god i've read books in art history where someone has gone through museums and like the places these people have studied and in a painting they feel like this person was based off of this statue and this gesture was based off of this painting and it's just like fine detail Uh versus oh yes it was based off of a miniature painting from South Asia. And I'm like, cool. Well, until 1947, you just referred to 50 different countries. <laughs> so. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. No, it's probably closer to like 100 different countries. It's just ridiculous. People are ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> that that um, shouldn't surprise you, though. Uh, so, yeah, I mean. It's a professional writing. Like, there's a lot more at stake. Uh-huh. There's a lot more importance to everything you're doing. Um, and my thesis was like 30 pages long. <clears throat> That's a lot. Two chapters of uh, fun writing is easily 30 pages. <laughs> it took me so many months to write my thesis paper yeah it and it's so much harder like creative writing is so easy right the characters are fun the situations are fun mm-hmm. you get to dream up ideas there's like puzzle making and creating a plot uh i think i wrote laughing all the way to london mm-hmm. sorry 
that's okay. I wrote laughing all the way to London in uh during grad school. So oh. I think I finished it like the summer after. Mm-hmm. Uh and you can kind of see like the extremes in that story where things are just like I don't care. I am just going to go with this really <laughs> random plot and I'm going to follow it. And like I came up with the last chapter in the beginning of writing that fic and I'm just mm-hmm. like we're going to lead up to this. This is going to have to escalate to this level of crazy. Fantastic. It is a very fun story, though. And I like the pairing. It's a rare pairing. It's fun. It yeah, was definitely fun. fun. I think I could have done the romance a bit better, but yeah. I I ended up being more concerned about the, the magic system and <clears throat> like the past romance with the OC. Mm-hmm. I think I got away with like an incredible OC that people actually fell in love with. And I was like, ha! <laughs> I like OCs. It's my favorite pairing. You could easily have written a full story just with Naomi. For sure. Naomi, I think I'm right. Yes. Yeah, Naomi. Um, speaking of many fanfics that you have written, uh, you seemingly have hundreds of ideas in your that brain of yours. What is your process for defining what is a good enough idea to write down? Like, how do you choose what's good and what's not? And how do you come up with these ideas? Uh, so, what determines if it's good enough to write is a motivation for me to continue. I don't like a lot of, like, I come up with thousands of ideas. Yeah. Not like uh, stories that don't have any like ability to continue past a certain point like i i read a lot of practice or a lot of stories where people pigeonhole themselves because they have to make their characters stupid in order or they have to be ridiculous to get around like obvious problems Mm -hmm. in star wars right you have palpatine if you take someone back in time What good excuse do you have for the character not immediately killing Palpatine? Yeah. If they can, why not? How are you going to get around, like, him immediately ordering 66, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And so there's, like, that's where, like, the puzzle making and writing comes for me. Like, figuring out how to get around those problems. Mm Mm-hmm. Um... I like time travel because outside of time travel, I'm really writing my own fiction, right? And I'm not getting paid for this. Yeah. <laughs> and it's more fun for me <laughs> to, like, subvert things or to explore different ideas um, and to really play in the world. Like, the point of fan fiction mm-hmm. is that you're playing in the world that already exists, yeah. right? So that you don't um, have to do a lot of the groundwork. Well, it's just like when I'm writing fan fiction, it's because I enjoyed the, I enjoyed that universe, right? Uh-huh. And once you get past that, a lot of times you're getting out of that universe in one way or the other. So time travel kind of ensures that you're, that there's a lot to draw from and that there's them still enjoying the fandom that I'm actually in and not just like completely like off span. Mm -hmm. Is Star Wars your favorite fandom? Yes, easily. So, because it's um, so huge, I watched. Right. Oh my gosh! Like my writing got so much better in it too. Like I wrote the Queen doesn't need to know. Mm -hmm. I went from struggling in Harry Potter (laughs) because really it's not my favorite fandom. I I read a lot of adult uh, fiction, so like. Patricia Briggs, uh, Chakraborty, which I guess she's uh, YA, as is Sarah Moss. Mm-hmm. Um, who else? Uh, Laurel K. Hamilton. There's just like a lot of things that I write that's not really a big fandom, or if it is, it's not a big uh, fan fiction uh-huh. fandom. Um, so, so there's not enough yeah. to. It's like, I love the people, I love the people in the fandom of Harry Potter, but the world itself is really boring. (laughs) (laughs) It's fun, there's a lot I can do with it, there's a lot I can, like, subvert, 
uh, there's enough wrong with the series that there's a lot of like interesting places you can go. Uh-huh. But ultimately, it's not not my favorite universe. And you've um, done a lot with it already. Yeah, and Star Wars is huge. Mm-hmm. Like, it's huge. There's so many, and like, you read, there's published books that are yep. basically fan fiction. Yep. Um, so it's wonderful. I was uh, listening to a podcast the other day about a guy who has written like seven books for the George Lucas, for the Lucas films. I, I forgot his name. I think it was Eric something. I don't remember. But yeah. I swear, if I, if I ever publish a book, <coughs> I really want to like approach Disney and be like, can I write a Star Wars book? Because <laughs> <laughs> like my fan fiction, there's a few of them that are definitely better than some of the published books I've read for Star Wars. Because yeah. some people just like, ah, the characters. Like they give in to like I think, okay, so one of my biggest issues with Star Wars is that it's so heavily influenced by Eastern philosophy mm-hmm. that at the last moment it turns left. It turns, like, hard into Western uh, understanding of theology. Like, people who have a background in Judaism, Christian, um, and Islam... Uh-huh. Islam is a little bit more flexible, and sometimes I think Judaism has, like, Judaism, I think that God is harsher, so I think some of the harsher, like, philosophies on life or death in the Eastern um, thousands of philosophies, uh-huh. you, they understand it a bit better, but still, it's like this understanding of, like, this one God, um, and God's are not the same, like, that word does not have the same meaning in Eastern philosophy. Um, and I, myself, am a practicing Buddhist, mm-hmm. so Star Wars is particularly frustrating in that they, um, this idea of attachment, first of all, George Lucas came up with the BS rule of no one's allowed to get married, and, like, being, you know, like, the, the Catholic priests that are supposed uh-huh. to be celibate and totally aren't. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, of course. He put that in there randomly in the second <laughs> second prequel movie, which would be the fourth Star Wars movie. Yeah. He put that in randomly to put tension for Anakin. And I'm just like, just stick with your love triangle. Because Padme Amidala slash Natalie Portman and Ewan McGregor makes so much more sense than that BS rule that you just made up. Especially the then, whole thing with the age disparity, like in the first movie, the Phantom Menace. And it just... It's so weird. It is weird, but like the other problem I have with it is it totally misses the ball on attachment. Like, in Buddhism, it's not attachment as in the things that you love or... Uh, having emotion it's not saying that emotions are bad it's not saying um that you shouldn't love it's saying um, you should step away and not let it control you yeah it's more it's not your attachment to the things you're you love it's your idea to attachment of that thing being permanent like your idea that this person is is your happiness uh-huh. that someone exists to fulfill that role in your life <clears throat> which they don't your mm-hmm. happiness does not come from another person um and everything dies right uh-huh. your attachment to not wanting to be in pain ultimately brings you more suffering and you can see a lot of ways in which star wars is trying to explain that concept uh-huh. And it just, like, goes off in, like, so much of the fan, like, because they portray in the prequels Anakin as the hero, Mm -hmm. but he's the villain, right? It's a villain's tale. Yep. It's someone who got pushed past the point. It's a downward spiral. And then then committed genocide. Yeah. Like, that's not, like, I like his, like, 
redemption in the original fic, but even in the original fic, he stands there and watches his son get tortured for a good long bit before he throws the Emperor over the edge. Not to mention he cuts arguably his own son's he wanted head. to do that himself for his own reason. Yeah. So I'm just like, I don't think that's as big a deal as you make it out to be. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, the prequels themselves, right? He falls because of his fear of his wife dying. Mm-hmm. And that's the real message of attachment, right? That not not that you were in love with this person, but that you were so attached to the concept of that person that you did harm, right? Mm -hmm. In Buddhism, there is this philosophy of do no harm Mm -hmm. to yourself and to others. And also understanding that just by living and like consuming, that you are inevitably going to cause some level of harm. But like, how do you walk softly? Like, how do you, uh, how do you go through life and like not leave as much damage? Like to do, to leave something better as opposed to being a part of that like strain on mm-hmm. society. There's, so, I, I, I'm not sure, and I might be uh, misrepresenting, but there's, uh, I think it's called a saying, could be a saying in Judaism that says leave the world a better place than when you first got into it. It's Absolutely. similar yeah. similar like I that. joined I joined the Ju- uh the Jewish club on my campus and mm-hmm. like have a lot of great Jew- Jewish friends and I don't know, there's something like very like holistic about Judaism that Christianity kind of like somehow misses. Um, and it's just, I think it comes down to like valuing intelligence, mm-hmm. valuing, like giving back in a, in like, it's a spiritual faith, but it's also a material thing. Like do better, like contribute to society. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of interpretations of Christianity, uh, <laughs> people take it to be like, I am perfectly fine the way I am, and I don't have to change. I just have to ask for forgiveness. And it's like, yeah, sort of, but like, there's a lot more to it than that, right? And you should do more than that. <laughs> and the, definitely the real Christians I know are are great people who do contribute, mm-hmm. but too often you have people who assign... I mean, I find this in every religion, right? If you are looking for human compassion and religion, you will find the best of humanity. You will find the same themes of love, of care, of forgiveness, and like all of these wonderful things. Uh If you turn to religion for justification for your actions, you are going to find hubris. You just Mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. All these books were written by men. Uh, They were written in political circumstances they've been edited for political means for control over a set population uh-huh. you will find human hubris in any written philosophy yep um that was a bit <laughs> off the topic but that's okay <laughs> I was like direct <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's fine that's perfectly fine um back to it how do you brainstorm how many hours do you spend brainstorming um so I kind of dream all the time. Mm-hmm. I just like I I have a lot to do in my regular life. I do like I'm living at home right now, so there's a lot of other people's emotions that I'm having to deal with and I like having running running scenes in my head, all moments of dialogue, um fun events when I'm driving a car just like waiting for meetings to continue uh-huh. um so it's just constant and i've always done that like that's something me and my friends would do like role-playing games uh i think where i was originally going with that tangent was before i could read right i had seen the original star wars trilogy uh-huh. on repeat uh-huh. it was star wars ben-hur the ten commandments uh the pirates of the caribbean trilogy uh-huh. and uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. Those were like lovely. the things I would put on repeat in the background. And Mine was I Harry grew up Potter in a neighborhood with boys. 
Uh-huh. And we would just like play Star Wars. Oh, and uh, Spider Man, Spider Man movies. Um, which you know, the recent Spider Man movie makes me so happy. They finished the arcs of my childhood. I was so satisfied. <laughs> you saw the new one. Oh, oh my gosh, we saw it on like the premiere night, and all the screaming. It was just one of the most joyous, uh, that's joyous nice. events. It was really good movie. No spoilers, though. <laughs> That's not spoiler anymore. Um, the brainstorm. How many hours do you spend doing it? You think? I I couldn't count. I do it before I go to bed. I mean, I spend days writing, right? Uh huh. Not actually that fast of a writer. I have gotten faster. Seriously, than, you. But you're um, so quick. It's more because I, like, devote a bunch of hours, right? Mm-hmm. Like, if I'm writing, I can sit still for, like, the course of, like, two hours and not get overly distracted. I'm easily distracted. I see a rainbow. I, ooh, shiny. Like, I multitask. I am someone who will list, almost always listen to music in the background. Yeah. Um, I'll put uh, politics, like, but specifically, like, the TYT channel, which is, like, this very pro- progressive channel. Um, <laughs> and they yell at propaganda, which makes me so happy because my studies are mainly colonialism. So when people yell at propaganda, I was just like, yes, preach. Um, but it's also, like, I know enough about politics and, like, especially American history and, like, modern history that it's pretty easy for me to, like, partially tune out. Uh-huh. Like, like, half listening. Um, don't your yeah. hands get tired writing? Ever? <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm probably slated for carpal tunnel when I'm older. Not excited about that. That's definitely going to be one of those things where I'm like, okay, my painting and carpal tunnel. Guess I'm just going to have to take those painkillers or just like muscle through it because I'm not going to stop painting. <sighs> yeah, I hit that older time already. Um, what is speaking of writing in your hands what is the writing process for you how do you you said you put on some music and then start writing but like do you have um, your I actually own talk with friends I really enjoy talking through ideas with friends mm-hmm. um, it's been harder lately because I think I've been writing since I've graduated, I've started writing more. Um, and I think I've outwritten all of my betas and readers. <laughs> I'm writing now faster than I re- anyone can keep up with me. Yeah, I'm sorry. And I'm like, new idea! And people are just like, okay, okay, I'm still like, I still haven't caught up on the other five. And it's just like, I have a new idea! <laughs> yeah, I feel that. <laughs> That's definitely <laughs> what happened. Do you spend many hours researching? And what um, do you consider that like you have to research this to get it right? So I so when I graduated uh, from U Chicago, that's when I got back into Star Wars, and I had the best moment of my life where I told my coworker, and he he just goes to me straight face, and he's just like, "You've taken your first step." into a much larger universe. <laughs> I'm just like, I lost my mind. I was so happy. Oh, I was so happy. And it was like the Claudia Gray Master and Apprentice book. So it's a really well written book about Obi Wan and Qui Gon. Uh-huh. Who I like so much better than like most of the things in Star Wars. And I was just like happiness and I uh so my uncle died of lung cancer and my grandfather died um in the same month Uh so i tend i like lean heavier into fan fiction when i have like when i'm dealing with grief uh depression and sorrow um Mm -hmm. and anxiety like those are the things that really get me writing um so i think aside from one year which was the year my uncle was diagnosed with lung cancer Uh in the last 10 years was something was the time that no one died, right? Okay. So I've had at least one person die, like, for, per year for the last bit. 
Jesus. Uh, I'm sorry. So I applied a graduate level style of research to mm-hmm. the Star Wars fandom. Um, and I don't know everything, but like I've surpassed the point where I think I know the most about Star Wars out of anyone in my circles. Yeah, I, like I said before, like I use your head can as can. Like if you tell me in your writing <laughs> something's true, I don't even check. I, it is true. That's it. That's it. I, I think I've, I've done a little less research. I mean, I think I'm going back into it because I have a. I finally came up with a plot for the original trilogy. Uh huh. And I want to bring in. So apparently, there's like Vader has an apprentice. Uh, there's some other like side characters and like the Death Squadron. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Uh-huh. So I'm going back and like seeing it, seeing what that is. Like, um, I'm kind of waiting on Thrawn because I know they're they're going to be Disney is going to come out with something about Thrawn, uh-huh. and I'm like waiting until I see it his, so his I can actually amazing. like get invested in it. I remember reading one by Darth Mars where Thrawn is holy shit, he's amazing. Horrible right? person, but amazing. Um, yeah. So here, on the research aspect, right? Uh-huh. Because of my own background, aside from like researching the fandom, outside research, I'll do some. But I've done a lot of research throughout my life that there's... You can always research more. Uh-huh. But basically, I find reading other people's books is a lot of research. You know what I mean? Uh-huh, it's enough. Yeah. So... Um, so yeah, I don't remember I, what I was gonna ask you. Like, not ask you, but like, <clears throat> I thought, like, you have a an LC character that is basically a third um, Padawan, the Queen Gon, Queen Gon, Qui Gon, Qui Gon, yeah, Qui Gon has. I think it's female, that he doesn't actually exist. And like, I was one hundred percent sure he existed because of you. Yeah, so the funny thing about Seymour, and this is where um, I get frustrated with the Star Wars fandom, instead of giving a legitimate reason for someone to have something or for just saying, oh, no, this one writer had a difference of opinion, people will, like, half-ass it, Uh and they'll just make the characters stupid. Like, a lot of Yoda's actions, like, outside of the original trilogy, they just make him stupid. And I'm like, stop. And for Qui-Gon, with the Femur arc, there's one comic that has him, and then there's one book that references him. And from there, th- everyone else is like, well, because we haven't mentioned him before, obviously, Qui-Gon, like, disowned him. Uh, and I'm like, why Why would you do that? <laughs> like, wh- who, who came up with that as a good idea to make... Qui-Gon Jinn, who apparently already has issues with Obi-Wan, uh-huh. and make him this cold-hearted asshole. <laughs> like, <laughs> come on now. I'm just like, uh, I get very frustrated. Same with Dooku. I read the Dooku book, and I was just like, that, I love that doesn't make sense. Why would you write him that way? I like, love, love, love your Dooku. He's thank you. Far, I love Christopher Lee. I'm yeah. just like, mm, do better. You had Christopher Lee. You can do better. <laughs> Okay, side note, mm. I highly recommend the audiobook um, uh, Children of Ruin, read by Christopher Lee. Children of? So, what? The book title, Children of? Uh, Chil- Children of Ruin by um, Tolkien. Oh, oh, okay. And Christopher Lee reads it. It oh. is... It is like they Game of friends, Thrones, right? but better and worse. Like you, I promise, if you read that book, you will realize that George Lucas does not have an individual thought at all. <laughs> He's a complete ripoff, milder version of Tolkien. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, a bit away from the whole topic of writing, in particular. Um, you changed names and accounts. Could you tell us a bit of why that it, that happened, and has it made any impact at all with your writing or uh, with your readers? Um. Yeah. So 
Disorder of the Phoenix, right, has a lot of problems to it. Uh-huh. Um, and then I think it was The Beauty Beneath, which I now rewrote as uh, A Beautiful Sacrifice. <coughs> I mean, that one has issues, too, because I literally wrote it in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> which, honestly, I wrote that, like, so fast and so much that I don't care that there's mistakes in it. I read it, I wrote that in two weeks. So, <laughs> um, but... The the beauty beneath, I don't know what it is about um Fleur Delacour and I think giving Harry the dark mark. I think uh-huh. that really upset people. Um and Disorder of the Phoenix has like some true issues. And people go back and read it. And I was in a very dark spot mm-hmm. when that all started happening and all of a sudden it went from like critique to you are stupid you are awful uh why aren't you writing more when are you gonna finish this i hate you for writing a new story like you suck and just like it escalated from like people just cussing me out to death threats and i was like i i don't understand the logic here why are you giving me death threats to continue writing do you think that I'm going to write better under gun? Like, what are, What even is this? Um, Jesus Christ. People are yeah. insane. Um, so originally, so <laughs> I identify as female, um, though I get very flattered if someone calls me sir. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, in the hierarchy of language, sir, like, is above man. Okay. So I, I get flattered if someone calls me sir. Um, when I've been writing my original fiction, um, a lot of the emotional themes, reviewers would write, this is too emotional, this is, like, sappy, this is what, da 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 uh-huh. When I published under a pen name that was obviously masculine, uh-huh. the comments were, wow, I can't believe you're able to write emotion so well. Like, this is really deep. And just, like, appreciation for motion that I was like, oh. This is happening because of gender bias. Yeah. Um, very clearly, like, I subconsciously, a lot of people, I don't even blame people necessarily for it because, like, the patriarchy is something that's embedded mm-hmm. amongst every culture around the world. Uh-huh. Um, so it's just very clearly there. So that's where the Jacob Apples came from. Mm-hmm. Um, also, my last name, meaning Apples, is where the Apples part comes yep. from. Uh, and I started writing Star Wars and I had a lot of the angry uh, readers from my HB stuff that would just like not obviously they're not reading the story and just telling me how much I suck (laughs) for not writing the HP universe and waking up to comments that were essentially go kill yourself yeah I like it it was just very frustrating and they would hit me at the wrong time, especially as someone who is dyslexic being called stupid. It was like the number one thing that I got from teachers. Mm -hmm. You're not trying hard enough. You're not doing well enough. Like it's, it's not even that I believe these people. It's that if I read that and I'm not prepared for it, it can hit me the wrong way because it's hitting on past trauma. Mm -hmm. So I moved everything or so oppo apples is the jacob apples account Uh so i made a jacob apples account i changed the original name and i moved it over like all of my other fix some of them are moving back as i edit them like what we lost Mm -hmm. um but i moved them all over so i lost a lot of readers but the huge percentage of readers I lost were that hate group. <laughs> like, so it doesn't them, really matter. Yeah. So like part of them came back in uh, Beautiful Sacrifice, the the hate group. Uh-huh. But even that, because it ended up being a completed story so fast and uh-huh. the turnaround was so fast that like that cliffhanger of like, he has the dark mark. Did it like it didn't sit with anyone. Right. Uh-huh. So even the people who hate that story can easily move on to something else. Um, yeah, and so Oppo is 
uh, a Star Wars character. He's a clone. He, that he, has... Is he real or like it's a an OC for you? I uh, no, he's a he's real. Okay. Um, I mean, just because he's an OC him... doesn't mean he wouldn't be real. But like, yeah, uh, you, but you know he... what I mean. So he's in the five hundred first. He works under Rex, um, uh -huh. another clone, and. Uh, he actually ends up being an Imperial. He survives the Clone Wars. Oh, um, But his helmet has an arrow on it, like Ong from, or Aang from uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. Oh, from Appa. And he is named after Appa. Yeah. <laughs> so it was the crossover between, like, my two favorite things uh -huh. was Avatar The Last Airbender and Star Wars. Yeah, okay. And I'm like, yes. I love it so much, and Abba means apples, so like apple apples. Yep. <laughs> um, so I adored it. It sounded cool. It's still masculine. Um, it like every time I see it, it just makes me happy because I'm like mm, Star Wars and Avatar: Last Airbender. <laughs> it's so much more yeah, you use to him who a lot I am in your uh, stories. Again, because like uh, I still like Harry Potter because of my friends. Not because of the series so much itself. <clears throat> uh -huh. So, um, yeah, moving on to Star Wars. I also just think that the quality of writing is so much better in Star Wars. I have so many more characters. The world is so much bigger. There's so much more room to explore. Mm -hmm. um, it fits my own preferences a lot better. Uh, it has darker themes that it, it could be... Harry Potter is very domestic abuse a lot of the time. Yeah. And it's not that you can't do other things, but in Star Wars, if there's any type of domestic abuse, there's a lot more going on in the universe. Yeah. Um, I also, I mean, I have a background in colonialism and history and art, and I love politics, and this kind of stuff is Really way easier for... to translate in Star Wars. Yeah. There's so much more to draw from, whereas uh -huh. you have to write almost all of that from scratch. Because, like, J.K. Rowling has... Nothing, it's, basically. It's funny. She has a very good perception of how media reacts to things. Like, you can definitely see that, especially in, like, the fourth and fifth book. Mm -hmm. she, she very clearly has an understanding of how media affects it. The seventh book shows that she has an understanding of, like, how fascism really takes over and people's response to that type of fear but she's not as good as writing the politics like the actual politics mm -hmm. of that uh, Star Wars much is, less on the economic uh, system all of that in the Darth Plagueis book I highly re recommend it to all Star Wars readers or if um, anyone in the fandom because uh -huh. it explains so much it makes the prequels actually enjoyable um uh, it explains the politics and what's going on and how the Sith are actually manipulating things. You're like, oh, so the plan wasn't stupid. That's good to know. <laughs> um, you have a bunch of stories going on, many of which are still actually going, uh, ongoing. How do you keep track of it and don't get lost uh, with your characters? Um, so I have several outlines for each one. Um, as oh, I'm writing, uh, sometimes sorry, uh, things change. Are you 100% an outliner, or are you a discovery writer most of the time? Discovery writer? Yeah. Like someone who uh, figures out as they write? Yeah, that's it. Um, I'm both. I think I'm primarily a discovery writer, but I think I also... Like, The Queen Does Not Need to Know, which is my longest fic. Uh -huh. um, it is... Plot, it was plotted all the way through and I kept adding to the plot line I don't think I've ever written something that's that <laughs> well plotted mm -hmm. and I still have friends that say it's like the best thing I've ever written um, yeah, and definitely it. it shows for it how much, like, much work I put too. into the outline yeah um, in fact that story is technically only it half yeah. of what I originally attended the audience though for an evil Anakin is very small <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was just like, okay, this is not. It had such a small following anyway that I was just like, mm, not necessarily going to put this continued amount of work into something that doesn't actually have a strong readership. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when half the reviews are just like, why are you doing this? 
Um, but I think so. I I enjoy plotting the puzzle part of it. Um, I feel that when it doesn't have the discovery element in it, I lose interest. Uh-huh. If it doesn't, if like the characters aren't feeding surprises to me, I'm not as interested in continued writing it. Uh, so it's kind of like it needs both. I need a plot. I need to know vaguely where I'm going. Uh-huh. Um, I need events, but then I also need the characters and storyline to be feeding itself. Uh-huh. Um, so keeping track of it, right, like, I remember what I wanted. You know what I mean? If I don't remember where I wanted, that wasn't that important anyway, so I can take <laughs> it into a new direction. Like, I just uh, finished reading how it ends, and I was like, oh, I I initially liked where this was going, but it's all lecture. I'm like, oh, this is just, like, point in place, like, fix it. And I was just mm-hmm. like, this sucks. So, like, I, I, like, added a few lines at the end and, like, ended it. So, um, yeah, I definitely see... The fun thing about fan fiction, right, is that I can I can experiment like significant brain damage. I went above and beyond and s- saw how big my plot could get. Yep. Um, and just trying out like different tropes. Like now, I'm trying to figure out like the slow burn romance. I'm told that I can do romance really well, uh, but I I feel like I have a harder time plotting that. So. W- Plotting it in a way that feels good to me, that is. Mm-hmm. So fan fiction lets me experiment with those type of things and developing plot in a way that continues yeah. to engage me. Yeah. Like a lot of my writing is just figuring out what engages me yeah. uh, and then what engages the audience. My favorite romance from you, although it's not 100% romance, it's more like a, a angst and comfort is what we lost with Andromeda. It's just lovely. It, it's probably my favorite of all. And I have think... like dozens. So. <laughs> so, I was talking with my mom about this, and... She knows the right fanfic. Yeah, I... The reason why I have a, a good time, or... Where my inspiration basically comes from for those really complex relationships mm-hmm. is I'm often the person who people tell things to. Mm-hmm. Um, and really just listening to people. <laughs> and like, I I sometimes get too invested in other people's... Uh, yeah, it's just like in wanting to make them feel better and really... Generally, I'm happy if everybody around me is happy. Um... <laughs> uh, Mm-hmm. Which tends to be a problem if, like, the people you're living with are just chronically upset. But, oh, yeah. Um, I know that feeling. <laughs> uh, but I've been around enough abusive relationships um, to see and understand how people still love each other past that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've also have a lot of friends from broken homes <clears throat> who've been through the foster care system. And, like, whatever issues me and my parents have, like, I know my parents love me. Mm-hmm. Um, and really understanding that for my friends, that I am very blessed and lucky in that my parents love me. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like a lot of people have this assumption that, of course, your parents love you. Or, per- of course, your parents say they care. When that's and not you take for true. granted when that's not that's not a thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like that not everyone loves their kids, that never not everyone wants their kids, that there are people who are narcissistic enough or like damaged enough that they're not able to meet the needs or even try to mm-hmm. meet the needs of their kids. Much less want um, to. Or they put the issues of the couple or the family or their own issues between any relationship they have with their children. Mm -hmm. And I've just found that people are very like unempathetic and don't listen as well as they should have. Uh, So when I'm writing my understanding of those really complex relationship structures 
tend to stand out against a lot of people who don't have those backgrounds. Or if they do, I've seen a lot of writers who are really good at like certain types of trauma, mm-hmm. but maybe haven't gotten therapy themselves. So like J.K. Rowling is actually, I think, an example of that, where she has a lot of issues that come out in her writing and they're present like those harsh like her neglect and whatever shows in harry's a lot of the issues that harry has to deal with Mm -hmm. and that he pushes past them but sometimes she lacks like the connection because she doesn't understand her own the extent of her own issues in a way that she's dealt with them Mm -hmm. right where i very like i'm aware of my own issues today um but I also very fiercely went after my demons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, like, I know what my issues are because I was able to <clears throat> work on them myself, right? Mm-hmm. I was willing to be like, no, this this part of me is shitty and this is what's shitty about me. Um, and this is what I want to fix. And understanding having to deal with secondary trauma, um, kind of how you process that. Uh-huh. Uh, so yeah other words uh most people should have therapy and if you want to be a good writer uh go get therapy because your writing will definitely <laughs> reflect your understanding of it well people should get therapy anyways even if you're most healthy. people should have therapy it's okay to ask for help I, I and lo- i say that as someone who like uh my family was fiercely against me getting therapy i, I got it anyway i got therapy for me for my family not wanting me to get therapy I'm, <laughs> it worked <laughs> i'm happy you did i love the analogy that uh, you should always get therapy even if you're healthy healthy because you always do uh, uh, routine checks for your physical health so why not yeah. do it for your mental health as well i also i think there's something great in like I went to therapy for four years and a lot of it ended up being like, I am not crazy for feeling this way. And being like, this was a lesson I learned in grad school. No, that you were only crazy not... because of the amount yeah. of stories you read. Because that's insane. <laughs> um, I Amazing you my... insane. <laughs> I assure you my brain is more chaotic. Than <laughs> <that>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, in grad school, accepting that, hey, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. That not everyone's going to like me. Like, I want to find balance and peace with people. But I'm also not someone who's afraid of confrontation. Mm-hmm. Which, apparently, a lot of people are. Oh, yeah, I hate confrontation. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't... But like, I also I know that everyone it, loves me. But I'm not afraid of it. Because like, I'm adorable. I'm someone who will, like, step into the fray. <laughs> it's like if I need to save someone, I will save you, and I will get my ass kicked if I have to. <laughs> Most likely, I'm going to kick your ass. But besides the point, um, <laughs> I've been bullied my entire life. Like I have very thick skin when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> um. It's but yeah, just like you accepting you're not everyone's cup of tea. It makes life like realizing a lot of therapy for me was understanding that people being upset is not my fault yeah right someone is not upset because of something i did wrong and if i did do something wrong that upset them it doesn't necessarily mean that i am responsible for their feelings right i'm not responsible for their reaction to that Um, and that's something that you learn through experience and have to tell yourself repeatedly because we all fall into bad habits. That's something right? I'm still trying to learn. Myself. I think that, what is it called? Radical acceptance? <clears throat> Where you like have to accept something that is really beyond understanding. Mm-hmm. Just like understanding that other people's emotions, like it's not about you, is a really hard lesson to learn when you only can experience things from your own perspective mm-hmm. and you can't escape yourself. So, yeah. yeah, it's a bit of um, self-centered, self-centrism, I think it's called. Yeah. In a way, to always assume it's about you when it's really not. I mean, I, I feel like we're culturally, especially women, to 
to be the peacemaker, to be, to like make other people feel better. It's how we're raised. It's how the school system, right? And it's just like, there's so much other stuff going on in someone else's life. Don't worry about it. So that's why Google told me I'm pregnant. Because I'm a woman. (laughs) Because that's how I feel. (laughs) I I feel like men, especially um, if you're part of bigger families and Mm -hmm. you have to take care of more people, I feel like it shows up more. Yeah. Um, Honestly, caring about people uh, is feminized in a really bad way. Yeah. Um, Right? It's a good thing to care about people. It does not emasculate you. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's so dumb. Hey, you can show emotion. Hey, you can cry. You're a man. Yeah, yeah. But the patriarchy, right? Mm -hmm. If you feel those things, then you're less likely to abuse women. And what would the world be if you can't abuse women? If you can't be better than someone else? And it's like, ah, that that sounds unhealthy in principle. And it is. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Again, (laughs) a bit off topic. But you have, you've written many, 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 many stories about time travel. What is it about that setting that you love so much? Again, I just, uh, I get to stay in that universe, right? Uh And there's the puzzle making of figuring out how do I shift like a few things to have a massive butterfly effect? And how do I explore these characters? How do I explore these characters in these situations? Uh, Do you like doing paradoxes or not? I hate paradoxes. Okay. Um, if you're going to time travel and time traveling just ends up with the thing that you made to begin with, why? Right about That seems it. like the most pointless thing to me. I'm just like, yeah. fun adventure. What about... But like, I can't even read it. What about uh, JK's own paradox? Is the time turned up? Um, the it's one a loop. in uh, the third book yeah, is yeah, fantastic. Ask about like that's a fantastic like she plotted that very strongly it wasn't the whole of the story and it really it was a time travel that explored the characters more deeply uh-huh. and especially in a series like that i think the prisoner of azkaban teaches us more about harry than almost any other book i love it um, it's my favorite like, book of the series of the whole series it's just yeah it really delves into the characters i don't think i've written a lot in the third book just because it is so well done yeah, I'm right? trying to remember. There's a few. I think nobody, I think... nobody stays dead. Is the one that I wrote in the third book, and that I just like was with the wish for yeah. moment, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with James and Lily. But, uh, yeah, but um, when it comes to like the cursed child, mm. stabby, stabby, stab, 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 stab. <laughs> <laughs> um, I enjoy I... the conversation with Snape. And I think one moment with Dumbledore's portrait, and then everything else can rot in hell. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> <coughs> it's okay. You laughed so hard you died. Uh, <laughs> I, I tend I... to have that effect on people. <laughs> uh, how do you pick shadow points in your uh, in your time travel stories, like in Star Wars? Like, where do you pick? I want to go back to this time. I want to go back to this and this. How do you pick that? Um, so... And, but also, how do you choose which characters to take from the future to the past or the past to the future? Like okay, so I Ray. unabashedly have an obsession with Obi-Wan Kenobi and yes. Ewan McGregor. Yes. Um, Who doesn't write? I can't... I mean, it's just... I don't know. I, like, tend not even to like blonde blue eyes. Like, it's pretty. But, like, not especially attracted to men with that, but just like you and McGregor, I'm just like, mm. I'm I'm pan, but, like, I'm specifically gay for him. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I also like that, like, the prequel is shown mainly from Anakin's perspective. But it's really Obi-Wan's Kenobi is the hero tale oh, in yeah. that. Um, Are you looking forward to the who, series? Here's someone who, yeah, has made a lot of mistakes, mm-hmm. but not because he, like, willfully did it. He wasn't 
there's no point in which he was intentionally trying to do harm, uh, which is important to me. Because, like, I like characters that even if they screw up, it's not because they they purposely were ever imagining they did harm to someone. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Or saw themselves doing it. Like, when Anakin freaks out and, like, kills someone and then tries to justify it, uh-huh. like, I don't I don't appreciate that. Whereas, like, Obi-Wan, if he makes a mistake in the story, and there's many things in the Clone Wars uh, TV series I disagree <laughs> with that make no sense to me. Uh, like George what? Lucas has those moments. Uh, like, uh, the point where Obi-Wan, like, doesn't stand up for Ahsoka Tano. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah like, yeah. this really random night. It's so did. weird, like, why not? Why, why wouldn't even it's, Anakin do something? That's, like, very much forced plot armor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I disagree with stuff like that. But, um, <laughs> otherwise, like, Obi-Wan is making a lot of mistakes, but he's not doing it purposely. And he doesn't, if he does make a mistake, there's a lot of, like, self-hatred and re- uh, like repercussions that come with that. Yeah. And here's and he's someone a lot who of had false informations and wrong information too. So. Yeah, and here's someone who's been through actual hell and still holds on to hope. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Anakin is a victim who succumbs to his trauma, mm-hmm. and I don't find anything um, inspiring about that. Uh, and I know that a lot of people. Uh, identify with the extreme emotions he has. Uh-huh. Um, but as someone who has been abused by character types like him uh-huh. and has my own anger issues, I definitely deal with it more as like inward, outwardly shut down, mm-hmm. inwardly suffer. Which I think is more Obi-Wan's speed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is I really identify him. Suffering quality. Yeah. I really identify with that. Um, I like, I want more Ewan McGregor. Very excited for next year. Yeah. Uh, so Wait, I it's think... only next year. 23? Yeah. 23? 23, yep. Oh, fuck so... that. I thought it was this year. No, no. Uh. Which, which is kind of okay because I, next year is American election cycle. And I'm like, mm, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Something <laughs> to look forward to. Other than my politicians lying to me and selling me BS. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, um, yeah, I think so. It's curious you mentioned ends... that, sorry, um, about um, Anakin, because like Anakin's probably my, th- I want to say third because it's Obi Wan and then Dooku for me of your characters. Like I really like your Anakin's, pretty much yeah. all of it. So it's funny you say that you don't like writing him at all like you don't find him interesting because he's really like good the canon i think the reason why i don't <laughs> like him in canon is i don't like what they did to padme amidala right i don't like yeah. how characters respond to him and i don't like how the audience responds to him like their obsession with this victimhood mm-hmm. and like this radical forgiveness of anything and i'm just like i explained this to someone else where i'm just like uh George Lucas is very inspired by American history. In that regard, the Jedi become the indigenous people, this foreign philosophy, um, and the clones become um, people who were brought over by the Afri- uh, the Atlantic slave trade. Uh-huh. And they both get like slaughtered en masse and forced to do these things and like lack of humanhood and you have Anakin who's an outsider but yet is identified as the slave Uh and then goes in and just blames everyone else for his issues I hate that like I hate that Mm -hmm. um so when I write Anakin I either make him the villain in such a way that it isn't I'm doing the right thing it's I accept that I'm being a bad person person or I've broken so badly that it truly doesn't become his fault. Whereas I see the canonical Anakin of having so many opportunities to do better and to get help. And um, actually doing and, it. And he does it. Like, he's talking to Yoda in riddles. Palpatine has turned him against uh, 
against Obi Wan. I get it that Obi like people see Obi Wan as harsh. Um, but I'm like, that's not a good enough reason to m- completely miss that this character loves you. You know what I mean? Yeah, especially after or so like much to miss stuff that together. this character very much knows that you're in a relationship with this person. It's just like. There's just some things that are completely stupid. You know what I mean? <coughs> yep. Um, the love triangle would have made way more sense. Um, and if I am redeeming Anakin, I have to do it pre, pre-genocide pre or make the genocide, like... Go away? And not so much go away, but, like, if I'm writing Darth Vader, I love Darth Vader. I've always loved Darth Vader. I loved Darth Vader before I understood anything of the prequels mm-hmm. for years. Um, Wait, there, uh, you when you started uh, watching Star Wars, you you already had the prequels, right? Um, they were out, but I didn't have access to them. I only had the DVDs for the three originals. Oh, okay, okay. I think I'd seen the first one, which okay. doesn't actually like Revenge of the Sith in the first movie or Phantom Menace are not the same thing at all. Uh huh. Um. One is just like, oh, this is kind of fun, and Obi-Wan! Um, <laughs> and, like, Alec Guinness, right? He's fantastic. So, again, like, people are getting really upset about him lying to Luke, and I'm just like, I'm not sure if I would tell my kid that, hey, your father's a genocidal maniac. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, mm, would I tell someone that? Maybe, but, like, maybe not when they're 19, when their family's just been slaughtered. Yeah, for sure. But I said Empire. She's like, oh yeah, your your father just like led to the slaughter and like he's your massive enemy. Like the drama is fantastic. I love the original trilogy has its issues, but it's solid. Um Yeah, so if I'm writing Anakin, I I lean into the villain, right? Here's the <laughs> character who's obsessive about his son, um hates everything, hates everyone. And I have fun with that, mm-hmm. right? Um, I don't worry about redemption. There is really, like, if he does a good thing, he does a good thing, but that doesn't make him a good person. Uh-huh. Um, so I, I write him as a villain, and I enjoy him as a villain. Or, you know, I save him from toxic victimhood <laughs> if I write him free that. Have you ever, um, I'm assuming you did, but have you ever thought of bringing? No, actually, I think I did do that, like bringing Vader as Vader back to uh, the time where Anakin was a not a kid, but like uh, during Clone War, with both uh, alive, not replacing one another. Uh, so no, um. It's been done a lot. I've enjoyed oh, yeah? some of those fics. Um, I don't read any fanfic, Star Wars fanfic besides yours. So I, I wouldn't, wouldn't know. I wouldn't write it just because my view on Anakin tends to piss so many people off. Uh-huh. That um, I still am trying. There's a few fics where I'm making Anakin Darth Vader um, in the timeline that he's set. I think I did in significant brain damage. Anakin has a turnaround arc mm-hmm. where he's exposed to what he did as Vader. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think primarily his fight with Ahsoka, um, as Darth Vader, and I show him that, and that causes like, a radical that... change in his own view of himself and realizing, because I think this is the part where people I think really mess up with Anakin's character, if Anakin understands the part he plays and like what he did wrong and really accepts that that would cause a radical change in who he is and how he responds to the world you know what i mean it's people who don't give him character development are just like i'm just gonna justify this issue because victimhood it's like that's not compelling at all mm-hmm. you meant the fight with Fasoka in that uh in Rebels, yeah. Rebels, I like showed him right that. before she gets yanked and, into the yeah, so, thing. Yeah, in significant brain damage, my Anakin realizes how far he can actually fall. Uh-huh. Right? Because we have, like, 
we all believe it of ourselves that we have limits. Uh-huh. That there there's limits to like even if we did do something bad, there's limits to how bad we could do something. Mm-hmm. Um, and I make Anakin confront that, and there's self loathing in that. Um, there's a lot of character trends, and I think a lot of people are just like, "Oh, you're bashing Anakin, like you hate Anakin," and I'm like, "I'm not like these are things he did canonically." Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I'm giving him an opportunity to change before that. Yeah. That's not unfair. That's not bashing. That's do letting you, the character grow. Speaking of bashing, are you a fan of bashing? Do you like bashing? Do you hate it? Uh, what are your thoughts um, on bashing in general? So I think how it ends is a bashing fic. I reread it and it was super cringy. And I really, really hate the lecture stuff. And I've done it myself and it's a trap. It's mm-hmm. a trap. Um, <laughs> My only excuse is how it ends. I wrote while watching the Clone Wars, not after I'd finished the Clone Wars. So now that I've finished the Clone Wars, I feel like I'm done justifying just, uh, justifying stupidity of mm-hmm. certain arc choices. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like Star Wars fandom is huge. I don't have to treat everything as like this is how the character is. Um. Especially if they've gone against so much. Like, they retcon so much. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, setting aside some of that, uh, I don't enjoy bashing if it's lecturing because it's, it's the fix it. And I've done it myself again. So, mm-hmm. but I, when I see it and recognize it, I don't enjoy it. I do, however, love drama. <laughs> so, like Molly Weasley, I enjoy the hell out of the drama that comes from her like flipping out <laughs> i love it um i love the drama of dumbledore being either exposed or just like having to face like his mistakes uh-huh. i love that i love characters dealing with like emotional turmoil which i understand people will say is angst or bashing but i think it comes short of that because drama is it's it's emotional turmoil, and then angst is something that doesn't make sense in you harping on something emotional issue and making false conflict. Uh huh. Where there's so much opportunity for real <laughs> conflict, uh, emotional or otherwise, that um, yeah. You feel You're angst just... is basically just drama for drama's sake. Yeah. So yeah, I don't <laughs> like the lecture, and I don't enjoy. Um, it, it, the stupid fix it or like useless angst real drama and characters worrying and being anxious or depressed like I'm anxious and depressed uh-huh. I can relate with that <laughs> so. um, you've decided to start writing original fiction how different is the writing process from fantasy we talk about a, we talk a bit about it uh over the research and how you don't build the world and the scenes in fanfic because people already know about it. But is there anything else that is different? Um, so it's longer. Way longer. It takes so much longer to write it. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly because there's like a lot of... I need to build up so much, right? And I think lately I've been getting overwhelmed by how much I have to explain <laughs> mm-hmm. without info dumping. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's I'm more a critical issue. of it. Like I, I need to get to the point where I'm just writing without looking backwards uh-huh. and just being like, I can rewrite this as opposed to this is this. And I come up with the plot and then like I have no motivation to write it. Uh, so... But they tend to be harder pushed. Like, there's a lot of things in fan fiction where, like, I won't kill Obi Wan. Uh-huh. Right? Even when I kill Obi Wan, I won't kill Obi Wan. Um, I'm alert. writing original uh, fan fiction. Or, so, yeah, the original trilogy fan fiction. I have it planned out. It's uh-huh. going to end badly. And then I have a second arc that's going to time travel it. So I have to deal with those losses. Like, Oh, the clones, dear. Order 66, the, the <coughs> Mesh Genocide of the Jedi. Like, I have a hard time sitting with those things. Uh-huh. Um, in my original fiction, I've done worse. I've oh. done so much worse. Oh, boy. 
to my characters um and to the world and oh it some of my characters are just awful I have this one woman who had like seven kids and one survived like uh, uh because of her uh it's because of previous husbands oh so lovely. like there's just it's a lot of dark it's like um, a lion who kills the pups yeah i don't like I had someone comment recently, oh, you don't pull punches, and I know it. And I'm just like, mm. my original fiction, like, there's a lot of plots that I've written for my original fiction that I actually had to move down from, like, generationalize it, because it was so harsh and so depressing. You don't pull punches. That's not something I could publish a book on, right? It would just be too dark. You don't pull um, punches, you'll bring a bazooka. Yeah. <laughs> I bring a Death Star. Oh boy. (laughs) Do you see yourself as a writer full time? Uh, no. No? Uh, I think if I ever had the luxury of just like living at home with kids or whatnot, I might. You know what I mean? Um, Mm -hmm. Do you want kids? I want kids, yeah. Um, I don't have them. I don't want them. Uh, Grab yourself one in the street. That's it. I'm at the stage of my life where the hormones are real, and I realize it's the hormones, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I work with children now, and they're like, ah, babies. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, my cat. My dog is giving my cat a kiss. It's very cute. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry, distracted. That's right. Yes. <laughs> that stopped me being cute. <laughs> okay, you'll probably have to cut that part. That's fine. Just stop being cute, Vicky. <laughs> the cat. <laughs> it's like the dog. <laughs> I heard. Um, moving on. What do you wish there was more of um, as far as tropes or characters or even pairings go? Uh, were the tropes I like? Yeah, like in, in fanfic. Like, so, what kind of trope would you see more? Would you want to see more? Um, Is there any? Sometimes I wish there was more romance. Uh, I wish there was more time travel. Um, I wish there was less, like, hate fix. Um, yeah. Uh, I love time travel. Time travel. Yeah, I wish, uh, there's just, like, some really good romance that I've read, and I'm just like, I want more of this so much. <laughs> mm-hmm. I want more, um, especially as I find it's a weakness of my own writing, I really enjoy someone else doing it, so I'm like, ah, oh, I can enjoy this. Um, so, yeah. I'm a sucker for the romances. And characters. Is there any character, and character. you wish? To see um, more? I, oh, I always wish there was more Obi-Wan. Yeah, of course. Um, you never tried writing, um, like, uh, pre, pre Republic, I think it's called. Like, back in the Revan days. No, I haven't read enough, and I'm not, even if I think I read it, I, I would treat it more as a novel in uh-huh. and of itself than, like, a fandom. Uh huh. If that makes sense. Uh, I think so. There's some really good one-offs I've read, but, you know. Um, time traveling to the future isn't that much fun, and time traveling backwards to something that has, like, limited plot mm-hmm. is not necessarily something I love. Again, like, original trilogy is... That's my introduction to the fandom. Uh-huh. So, and that's... I bounce back from there. Gotcha. Um, Honestly, there's so much I would change about the sequels. I would be comfortable reading there. But, like, people are so hot and cold. And they're just like, ah, I haven't even seen, like, said and said movie. And I'm just like, okay, this is pointless. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, people can be really annoying with some stuff. Um, what are your least favorite tropes? And fairies and characters. And why? Um... Let's see. For Harry Potter, Mm -hmm. uh, relationships with Draco. Okay. uh, Hermione and Ron. (laughs) Okay. um, 
and not even because I think Draco is such a bad character, but um, like I'm gay, mm-hmm. but I don't know why like certain things are a gay kink. Where all of a sudden, like the characters go out the window and they're just gay. And I'm like, gay is not a personality trait. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> I usually don't eat flesh, so. It's like, it's I a haven't... genre unto itself. And mm-hmm. I'm like, LGBT should not be a drama. My sexuality and my gender are the two least interesting things about me. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, I don't enjoy a lot of, like, a lot of it. I'm just like, why are you, just why? Make it such a um, big deal of it. And I've read some really good LB- LGBT plus things. Uh-huh. But primarily, they're just like, we're going to break all of the characters and all logic and make these people, like, hopeless fluff things. Or, like, BDSM relation. Not that there's anything wrong with BDSM, but, like, to just have that take over the characters uh-huh. is very obnoxious to me. Um, and then uh, <laughs> the lecturing stuff is, again, another theme I just like. Uh, um, In characters. I, you know what? I think the thing that I, annoys me the most is probably, like, romance that's just... Or like pairings are just like these characters are together and that is the thing. Like there's no build up of that, there's no explanation of the characters, there's no like real build up to the romance, it's just we are a pairing and that fixes everything. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Then it's not basically a romance, okay? So it's just yeah, we're together. It's like putting uh, little hearts in the notebook with their names on. Yeah, it's, some of it's just ridiculous. <clears throat> um, how do you prefer receiving feedback from readers or other authors? Uh, reviews. I love the longer your review is, the more I'm happy. <laughs> Especially <laughs> when people are just like responding to things. Uh huh. Um. What kind of review do you, um, how do I put it? <clears throat> do you prefer uh, reviews chapter by chapter or a full review after the whole story? Uh, I love chapter by chapter, especially if they're long reviews. Um, if you're just gonna give me one liner, I'd prefer like a longer review at the end of the fic. Okay. Uh, who has helped you the most with your writing career, and who is your biggest inspiration, both in the fan fiction world and the traditional literature? Um, well, you were one of those people. Ah. Oof, um, oof. My friend Alexander, mm-hmm. uh, my friend James, um, anyone who really, like, engaged me in conversation, uh-huh. um, and, you know, bounces off it ideas with me yeah you really like uh um, a soundboard it's really helpful though it's really really helpful plus i get uh, to have yeah. all the cool plot stories ahead of time ah i love i love all of it i love the conversation around it um as for inspiration I really read too much, so I don't have, like, a specific, like, one person. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say one of the things I get a little bit frustrated with, with reviewers and people who read my work are the people who are complaining about my update speed, because I follow other fix, and Mm -hmm. I'm lucky when they, like, update every year, like, once (laughs) every year. Yeah. So that annoys me, and then... Um, there's a lot of fan fictions that I've read where there are only a few chapters in, and it uh-huh. sparks ideas. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I really, of course, enjoy the people who have finished stuff and who have like read stuff, but even just like reading other people's <laughs> ideas, like spark ideas of my own. Uh-huh. Um, original source material. Um, 
But the main inspiration really comes from people's responses, right? Because I write fan fiction to be a part of the community Mm -hmm. um, and to get feedback and to see how people react. Um, Knowing how people feel or are responding to my work is really why I keep writing, right? Um, Every now and then I get these people who are like, thank you for writing. Like you helped me through a tough spot. Mm-hmm. Or you help me process something, or like even people are like, I am crying. Um, as someone who represses a lot of my emotions, um, I know what it feels like to read something that makes you feel something. Mm-hmm. So that's why I keep writing fan fiction. Okay, that's fair. Um, what would you say is your one thing that has influenced you as a person? Uh, to make you who you are, uh, either a fanfic, a book, movie, whatever, uh, to the point where your life has changed, changed completely. And why do you because love of that? fan fiction or just like random things? anything, anything, whatever it is. Um. So when I was seven, mm-hmm. I saw a documentary about uh, Nefertiri. Um. The, so nice. Egyptian. Egyptian uh, mummy finding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. this one researcher thought that she had found um so her body's missing she's she's the fair she was a female who became a pharaoh i think she's right before king tut or mm-hmm. like two people before king tut mm-hmm. um her and her husband uh so egyptian has a um a poly um i ah, forgetting the word but where there's many gods. Uh, uh, her and her husband, uh, monotheism, mm-hmm. they tried switching to the sun god. Uh-huh. And Rock, they changed right? the style of the art <clears throat> radically. Like, radical changes, which is oh. in Egyptian history. Like, you have thousands of history where the style of painting doesn't change. Uh-huh. And that's very purposeful. It's not because, like, the artists didn't have talent to do other things. It's this is the style, right? Um, in Egyptian art, actually, the the more realistic and the less stylized they are, the less important they were. Like, they have found paintings are super realistic of wrestlers. Uh-huh. Um, and they're just, like, people wrestling because it was a sport that they watched. Um. So I saw this, uh, and there was some violence in it. It was a really, they had, so they were showing the mummies and then they would have flashbacks, Mm -hmm. um, to like people in costume, like living stuff out. And I was obsessed with this. So obsessed that like I stayed up till like midnight watching it Mm -hmm. and my mom ordered it. So then I watched the DVD version of it and it just like, fed my love for art and history and like I was obsessed with dinosaurs um, <laughs> dinosaurs and mummies and just like Indiana Jones I love Discovery Channel I miss it so uh, much the mummy like my friend uh, was into horror movies mm-hmm. and like sometimes it was a little much for me but I loved it um, still enjoy horror movies yeah I'm so that cool, though. really changed my life like by the time I reached high school um struggling between <coughs> I really enjoy history and politics uh-huh. I wanted to be a marine biologist I really enjoyed the sciences and I really enjoyed art um, I wasn't as good at the sciences like I enjoyed it mm-hmm. I still do but um, the thing about marine biology is going into the ocean is dangerous oh yeah uh, less so than the sharks are like the microorganisms and like little cuts and mm-hmm. like water pressure. Yeah. I honestly consider those things to be more dangerous, um, as well as like the toxins that get thrown to the ocean. I'm petrified um, scared stiff of uh open open ocean. I love it. I love being on the water. I don't enjoy being in it as much <laughs> just because I know what's in it. Mm-hmm. Um I don't like dead things. Like I don't like dead animals. I love animals, but I don't like dead animals. And the thing about working with animals is eventually you see a lot of dead animals. Um, and marine biology I find to be very depressing because no one in our planet seems to give enough a shit about global warming that they're willing to make radical changes. And it's just so depressing. 
Mm -hmm. Um, it's why I enjoy history because I can look at things at a macro scale. Uh I am very selective about the biologies that I read, um, and autobiographies I read because I find them, I get too wrapped up into them. Like I can cry from reading a textbook. So like the macro is easier for me to process. Um, Uh I enjoy fiction because I can process (laughs) things that are micro, but then put it away. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm enjoying someone's suffering in fiction, it's okay. I can put it away. These are not real people. Even if they help me understand real people better, like I don't have to treat my enjoyment of reading them Mm -hmm. as part of that. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't have to hold on to that trauma. Um so yeah, and the funny thing about the that movie is when I was taking my ancient art uh like core art history class Uh uh-huh so in the movie they say 13 years later like we won't be able to open this tomb for another 13 years because of the egyptian government Uh uh-huh so they sealed it back up and the researcher was like i won't know for 13 years if this isn't if this is who i think it is i kid you not we hit the egyptian section and I opened up my phone. I was like, hey, it's been about 13 years. And I looked it up. And literally within that week, they had just released an article proving that it wasn't Nefertiri. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, and that's sad, like but the, awesome. But like the synchronicity of it. Like, it was so cool. I was just like, oh, my God. Like, I got my answer. I waited 13 <laughs> years for that answer. And I got it. It was the timing of it. It was just like. Is it just like I'm in the right place in my life? I'm, just, I'm doing the thing I need to be doing. It's a sign. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, if you could give our listeners uh, some advice about becoming writers, what would it be? What do you think? Read books. Read real books. Uh, fan fiction is fun <laughs> and it's great, but it's not real writing. And yeah. I say that as a writer. Yeah. Um, it's not. It doesn't have the same. I mean. The Twilight Era published a lot of books that were bad, but um, current books, especially modern fiction, like, this is stuff that's been picked out of hundreds of thousands of writers. Mm -hmm. Like, the quality of writing of published novels is sometimes, I mean, not the politicians, because that's all BS, but, like, fiction writing, Mm Mm-hmm. You're reading books that have been picked out of a pool of hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Like, it's been through multiple editors. It's been, like, your vocabulary is going to get better. Your understanding of characters, of plot flow, of, like, in-depth stuff. Like, even writing fan fiction, there's a lot of things I fudge. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a lot of things that, like, about my stories that could not be published because they don't fit a they don't have the right balance like real published books have a balance to it that is like fantastic Mm -hmm. um not everything published is good that's not what i'm saying but um if you want to get better at writing look at stuff that has been edited and peer-reviewed and read history watch politics whatever you're actually writing about Mm -hmm. learn something about that subject um it it helps, and it's the only way. The only way to get better at writing is reading and writing. And uh, if you don't have time for that, then you're not a writer. And what do you think would be the best thing to focus on as a novice writer? Like grammar, uh, syntax, uh, vocabulary. What do you think it's the go-to? Um, I, I would say that character development. Mm-hmm. Um, character development and then building towards a plot. Um, a lot of people reading fan fiction are just looking for those character interactions that, um, whatever published media didn't have time to focus on because of the plot. Right? That's the great thing about fan fiction is we get to explore character moments. Yeah. Uh, that are outside of the story. So, you're going to get a bigger audience doing that. Um, you're going to get a lot more feedback. And then building up that into a plot is really what you should be aiming at. As far as like 
obviously more people are going to read your stuff if it has grammar, uh-huh. better grammar and better spelling. Uh, but that doesn't a make published the host book harder. has been edited 50 million times over. Uh-huh. Most <clears throat> fan fiction has maybe lucky to be a third draft. Um, you shouldn't hold yourself to that big of a standard. Mm-hmm. Like, people are paying other people to edit their books. Yep. And if you're one of those million people who don't, who does not need help with spelling in grammar, congratulations, you get to focus on other things that you can fix in your writing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm envious of you, but you have other challenges that I'm sure you need to face. Yep. Um, last question. If you could give any advice to people who also have dyslexia and are afraid to try their hand at writing, because of the backlash from the re- from any readers and reviews, what would you say to them? Uh, people suck. That's um, true. And the only way you're going to get better is by writing more. Um, I've definitely found that audio, like audiobooks uh, specific to dyslexia, helps a lot. Um, having there are programs that read your chapters back to you. Um, I find that helps a lot, and that's mm-hmm. in everything. Like, if you're writing papers, applications, anything. If you have dyslexia, like, it's really best to ask someone to look over for you because you're always going to skip things. Uh-huh. Um, but if you're pressed for time, get something that can read to you, and you will pick out a lot of mistakes that you otherwise would have missed. Especially if it's, like, the wrong word that uh-huh. looks similar. If it's read to you, uh-huh. you'll catch it. Like relief and relieve, things yeah. like that. Uh, do you have any co- recommendation stories, uh, books, or? So, if you're a fan of me and you like time travel, mm-hmm. uh, Kim Harrison's uh, Operator, I think that's the second book. Um, but Kim Harrison's stuff has a really good time travel series. Uh-huh. Uh, separate from the Hollow series, which is for main fic, but or main. Star. Fandom, mm-hmm. uh, which is fantastic. I love it. But, um, yeah, the time travel <laughs> bit is really good. Uh, Checkerbory's work, uh, City of Brass, fantastic. Uh, um, uh, the Curse series, I, I forget who. Darth Plagueis, uh-huh. uh, Master and Apprentice, yep. by Claudia Gray, those kind of books. Very fun. Yeah, that's good. Well, thank you so much, Apples, for chatting with us today, and thank you, listeners, for sticking around. Next time, I will be interviewing uh, the Golden God himself, Petri, Petrificus Samotus, and hope to see you again. Keep reading and review and alter your love. Hopefully, Apples, uh, you could really make their day or even make a new friend. Thank you so much, Apples. Bye. Bye-bye.